We've received apologies today from Deputy David Cullinan, and I must just remind people of the mobile phone notice to remind members to ensure their mobile phones are switched off. Um, today, I'm very glad we have an engagement on alliance building to strengthen the European Union with Ms. Jill uh, Dunahoo, Director of Research, and Ms. Uh, Mary Cross, board member and chair of the future of the, of the EU27 group of the IIEA. I'm delighted to, milk, to welcome Ms. Jill Dunahu and uh, Marie Cross here to the committee today. Ms. Dunahu is the director of research and Ms. Cross is board member and chair of the group of EU27 at the Institute, of, as I've said. The IIEA is Ireland's leading European and international affairs think tank. Most of us will be familiar with their work. Recently, they, had, um, they have been doing uh, some really excellent work looking to the future of Europe. And as you all know, uh, during our discussions with regard to Brexit, while we're trying to deal with the issue, different issues, the different sectors, uh, one of the things we're trying to concentrate on a lot is the future of Europe. Because while we all know what things were like in the past, the way the structures were, with Brexit, obviously, there is a gigantic change and changes ahead. So, therefore, it is imperative that we all work to ensure that the future of Europe is um, something that we have a lot of thought, work and deliberation put into. Um, and I know you've been looking at mapping countries' profiles uh, in their EU Explorer. And I know, I know you've dedicated um, a lot of work uh, to the future of the EU, so we, we appreciate that very much. So before we begin, I must just briefly remind everyone of the rules on privilege. Members are, are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make them identifiable. By, by virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any persons or identity either by name or in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Uh, Ms. Dunhu and Ms. Casey, I or Ms. Cross, sorry, I will ask you to make your opening statements, and I'm sure the committee members will be uh, very glad to hear what you have to say and will have questions and comments for you afterwards. Thank you again for being here. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you very much for inviting us to meet with the committee today and to explore the issue of alliance building in the EU post-Brexit. Um, we're aware, Chairman, of your deep interest and commitment to European affairs and would like to compliment you on your participation uh, in the Europe Day debate uh, with Minister McEntee and others at the Royal Hospital on the 9th of May. Um, it's an honour to be invited uh, here today to address the members of the committee, some of whom I've had the privilege to meet in this context over the years. In this short presentation, I will outline the context in which the IIA's work on the future of the EU27 project is situated. Then I'll briefly explore just how the concept of alliances has changed as a background uh, to the work which the IIA has conducted in mapping possible future alliances for Ireland in the EU. I will briefly allude to our country profiles, uh, which the Institute has developed for this purpose as part of the project, and will conclude just on a few, with a few remarks on existing and potential alliances for Ireland. Uh, my colleague Mary Cross, uh, former ambassador and chair of our EU27 project, will give an overview of how the Institute has engaged with Irish citizens in the course of the EU27 project by hosting public events in Dublin at the IIEA and also in rural venues uh, nationwide and its online outreach strategy via podcasts, explainers. And finally, by convening a group of uh, young professionals, uh, emerging voices, whose publication we have brought with us for you today. Across all the elements of the project, the Institute has sought to amplify the voices and concerns of citizens young and old, urban and rural, and to bring European voices both to the Institute and to the regional venues in order to broaden citizens' understandings of the priorities and concerns of other member states, and also to listen to their priorities. 
I would like to acknowledge the key role played by Minister McEntee in the citizens' dialogue process in which we and the EMI participated. And I would like to thank the TDs and MEPs who were very gracious when approached to participate in our regional events. Um, on the context of our project, this is a strategic moment in the EU. Its institutions are in a period of transition, and the five key appointments uh, which are going to be decided at the European Council on the 20th and 21st of June are eagerly awaited. Um, we're on the cusp of the Finnish presidency, uh, which also will have to not just oversee uh, the Brexit process, but also uh, the MFF negotiations. However, the defining event in terms of the future of the EU was the Brexit referendum in 2016, which necessarily led to widespread reflection on the future of the EU post-27. This commenced with discussions in Bratislava and Rome and came to fruition recently in the Sibiu summit in Romania on the 9th of May. And the culmination of this process will be the EU's strategic agenda from 2019 to 2024, which will be decided in the summit uh, this month. One overriding conclusion from the process was the need to create new alliances between member states post-Brexit. This is particularly the case for smaller states like Ireland, which in the absence of the UK will need the support of other smaller states or alliances with larger member states in order to influence the EU in the future and to have its voice heard at the EU table. Although alliances are traditionally understood as a fixed association between countries with a common goal, a new interpretation of alliances envisages bilateral relationships which also allow for flexibility as well as long-term cooperation towards a common strategic goal. Alliances can also be used as an important foreign policy tool to advance national interests towards a common goal. And Ireland, like other member states, should seek to influence the EU's strategic agenda for the next five years and to shape EU policy according to its own policy preferences. To achieve this, it's going to have to turn its attention to reviewing already existing alliances, to consolidating its partnership with like-minded member states, and to exploring the possibility of creating new alliances with other member states in the EU26, even with those with whom we perhaps don't share um, uh, the same perspective on every issue. In a speech to the IIEA in May 2019, Mairead McGuinness argued that it's not sufficient to put on the green jersey in the European Parliament and to promote one's national interests in an overt manner, but that it's important to develop a broader understanding of the views and perspectives of others in order to proactively develop Ireland's influence in the EU by offering genuine support for the priorities of other states when required. So developing connections with our partners in the EU27 is not just a role uh, that is limited to official government relationships. It also involves engagements with parliaments, with civil society, think tanks and universities in order to get a deeper and more informed understanding of local issues in member states. And to this end, the IIEA engaged in a mapping exercise to identify relevant ideas from analysis of other think tanks in other member states, from speeches by ministers, parliamentarians and MEPs from partner countries, for the purposes of better mutual understanding of policy positions across the EU27. The EU Explorer is part of our three-year project on the future of the EU27, uh, which is kindly supported by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The IIEA developed a series of country profiles of the 26 uh, EU member states. It's set out in the form of a map of Europe, which is easily accessible on the IIEA website. It is an interactive web tool in, entitled the EU Explorer Mapping the Future of Europe, and it allows the user to hover over a particular country and to search either the overall profile of a given member state or to focus on a particular policy profile within a member state. Each country profile commences with a short overview of the political complexion of the member state and its vision for the future of Europe post-Brexit. Each one concludes with an exploration of pre-existing informal or formal alliances of that member state. 
We looked at individual policy areas, not all of them, um, unfortunately that was too, uh, um, uh, too uh, large a task. However, for the initial pilot project programme, we investigated issues such as the budget, EMU, taxation, defence, digital policy, justice and home affairs, agriculture, social affairs and trade policy. As I said, the objective of the profiles was to build an understanding of the wide variety of views and policy positions across the EU and most of all to examine the potential for alliances for Ireland with other member states based on either convergent or divergent strategic goals. To this end, we used a traffic light colour system and the EU uh, Explorer highlights areas of divergence from Irish policy positions in red and areas of possible alignment or existing convergence between Ireland and a given member state in green. Uh, one advantage of the Explorer is that it provides information that has not been previously available to policymakers or to the general public um, in an accessible visual mode. A somewhat similar exercise was carried out by a sister think tank at the European Council on Foreign Relations um, with its EU coalition explorer. They adopted a different methodology to us, identifying preferences, influence, partners and policies. One of the important conclusions of that study was that Ireland needs to select its strategic partners with care, prioritising those who already have a broad network of contacts and relationships. While the ECF or Explorer seemed to imply that countries on the periphery, uh, such as Finland, Portugal or Ireland, have more difficulty in engaging in successful networking, I would contend that Ireland's position as a psychological insider in the core of the EU since its accession, coupled with the practice of diplomacy and networking by the Irish Foreign Service, by Irish business people, citizens, officials and parliamentarians indeed in COSAC, is second to none. It's interesting to note that the Irish government approach to alliances seems to have moved from an ad hoc issue-based alliance to strategic partnerships with like-minded countries. An example of such an alliance is the so-called Hansa Group, which includes the Nordic Baltic states plus Ireland and the Netherlands. This group share a liberal economic view of trade and financial matters with a focus on growth and innovation. And in the absence of the UK, such a coalition of states is necessary for Ireland in order for it to have a voice at the negotiations. Uh, the IIEA, by the way, is having a public seminar in the autumn of 2019 in tandem with all the ambassadors of the Nordic and Baltic countries with the support of the Department of Foreign Affairs to develop uh, a broad exchange and understanding of our mutual uh, interests. Portugal is another small member state which, like Ireland, has long, a long-established relationship with the UK and is seeking to realign itself post-Brexit. As an Atlantic country, Port Portugal shares Ireland's interest in maritime issues, which we've seen this week in uh, the Seafest uh, in uh, Cork, in transatlantic relations, as well as a common interest in Africa. Similarly, Ireland is involved in the wider Group of 17 on single market issues. So although these are new um, alliances or alliances that are being developed, traditional alliances such as the Franco-German alliance will, however, continue to play a very significant role in, de in determining the future of the EU. It is important that Ireland should uh, continue to maintain a strong link to both France and Germany and to invest in deepening these relationships. Traditionally, the relationship with France was based on a common interest in the CAP, while the relationship with Germany focused mainly on financial services matters. Now there is an appetite to take cooperation to new fields, such as digital cooperation, where France, for example, is playing a leading role already in the area of artificial intelligence, and where Ireland is already establishing its digital credentials as part of the Digital Forerunners Group. The Institute is working closely with the French and German embassies in Dublin and the German ambassador in Dublin, uh, Her Excellency <coughs> Dijka Potzel, has invited some of our emerging voices to, and our Young Professionals Network to visit Berlin on a study trip um, in the autumn. Uh, we've also uh, organised a conference uh, with the French embassy on climate change, again trying to explore uh, commonalities of interest there. Um, the IIA's motto is sharing ideas and shaping policy and the Institute is grateful to the Department of Foreign Affairs for its support of this EU27 project which amongst other things examines how Ireland can play a leading role in certain portfolios 
in forming new alliances and aligning itself with like-minded countries to shape the future of the EU for the next five years. The EU's strategic agenda will provide the outline or the framework, but the challenge will be to fill it with ideas that represent the vision and the voices of our government, our parliament and our citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do you want to go right away now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Thank you also for the invitation. I'd like to echo Jill's thanks in that regard. Um, and Jill has covered uh, a certain number of the areas, and I'll just uh, add on some of the details of the projects which we're engaged in. Uh, I think it was clear that when the re uh, Brexit referendum uh, delivered the result that the UK wished to leave uh, the Institute uh, uh, with the Department of Foreign Affairs, um, look to the future of the EU27. Um, obviously much time and thought has been devoted to Brexit, but uh, I think uh, our focus as well was very much on the future of the EU and Ireland's place in it. Uh, as Jill has said, the future of the EU27 is a three-year project uh, which uh, the IIA has undertaken with the Department of Foreign Affairs. And the objective is to contribute to the debate about the future of Europe within the group of 27 member states uh, with the uh, idea of providing in-depth analysis and monitoring emerging trends in order to gain insight into the major challenges facing Europe and the EU. Um, it's also an exercise in listening to Irish people, their views of the EU, how they wish the EU to develop, and what issues are of concern and of interest to people here. Uh, I should mention that as we face the challenges of the future for the EU, there are a number of factors uh, that can guide us in the post-Brexit situation. Firstly, the most recent poll in May of this year showed an approval rating of 93% support for EU membership in Ireland. This has grown steadily and is now at its highest ever. And secondly, Brexit, uh, as I know members will be aware, has had the effect of exposing very clearly and in a very raw and sharp focus what the UK is losing. The Brexit debate covered very extensively in Ireland has had the positive side effect of providing more detailed information on the EU than might otherwise be effective. This is a significant support to the government in engaging with the strategic agenda of the EU and to the Institute in the rollout of the various programmes in this regard. Um, the IIEA, in drawing up the programme for the future of the EU, has been conscious of the need for Ireland to play its part in support of the European project as a whole. In this context, we are conscious that we must invest considerable resources in strategic cooperation with the other 26 member states. Uh, cooperation with the big member states is, as Jill has mentioned, uh, very important, and particularly in the Franco-German alliance. But we are also conscious that uh, cooperation uh, among member states and the smaller member states gives support and validation to uh, the larger member states and uh, in the EU as a whole. Uh, and that cooperation is vital, uh, not just the alliances with the larger member states, but among uh, also uh, smaller member states of like-mindedness. So the elements of the future of the EU programme, uh, there are a number of uh, programmes. The first one that was undertaken uh, at the beginning of the programme was a research, a research series of research papers uh, produced by the Commission which laid out the, um, uh, the policies in various areas such as the Eurozone, uh, security and defence, the EU budget, social policy, uh, and uh, globalization. And the Institute um, uh, researched these areas uh, and provided um, recommendations to the Department of Foreign Affairs. The Institute also produces its own research papers, uh, including on the future of the EU institutions after Brexit, the state of the enlargement agenda, the EU social agenda, uh, the European security and defense agenda, and a number of others. There has also been organised a wide range of events open to the public and they've been held uh, in the Institute with invited speakers from home and abroad, including European foreign and uh, finance ministers, MEPs, politicians, diplomats, EU commission officials and uh, academics and think tank members. 
and the purpose of these meetings is to inform the Irish audience of the views from other member states on the topics which are of significant interest in the discussions underway, not just in the EU, but of relevance internationally and which influence the EU in its interaction on the global stage. We have also organised uh, in the programme uh, regional events. So a total of six regional events have been held in towns and cities throughout the country, in Galway, Waterford, Limerick, Dundalk, Cork and Sligo. Each has had a different theme. The one in Sligo most recently was on climate change and the future of agriculture. The Limerick one in February was on how does the EU spend your money and uh, each one had a different theme. And each had a panel of politicians and leaders uh, on the respective topics. And these were very successful with very good engagement of the public and we were very pleased to go outside, um, outside Dublin and uh, gain the views of um, people in the various areas. Uh, a new and uh, exciting um, a development for the Institute is the Emerging Voices Anthology, and I think you may have a copy of this. Uh, the IIEA Emerging Voices Group, it's a, it's a pivotal component for us in the future of the EU27 project. And it brings an extra dimension and a fresh perspective to the work of the IIEA. The group was established in 2017 and the purpose of the initiative was to convene a group of emerging leaders from a diverse range of social backgrounds, taking account of gender balance. The group met on a monthly basis to share their vision of Ireland's place in the EU and to further their understanding of European affairs. And a collection of papers written by 18 members of the group reflecting their interest uh, in particular subjects and an interrog interrogative approach uh, of, to EU affairs. And they also proposed forward-looking recommendations in these papers. And this series of papers was launched in an anthology by Minister for State Helen McEntee last week on the 4th of June. Examples of the topics are citizens' engagement in Europe, citizen access to the European Court of Justice, the case for a European mortgage market, EU counter-terrorism policy, and reimagining re the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, as well as 12 others. We also have produced uh, in the Institute a list uh, of explainer series. And these are a series of short publications providing answers to common questions about EU affairs and providing insight into what goes on uh, inside the EU. Uh, uh, examples are why does the EU need 27 commissioners? How does the EU plan to spend your money? What are the key upcoming changes in Brussels? What is next for EU enlargement? Where does the EU stand on European defence and security policy? And a number of others. Uh, we have a total of 11 and four more are in production. The IIEA is also um, working on producing a series of podcasts due to be released very shortly and following on a two-weekly basis. Um, these will deal with broad themes such as EU institutional affairs, populism, migration, transatlantic relations, the elections to the European Parliament. The purpose of the podcasts is um, to attract a wider, younger audience who sees uh, information and analysis in an audio sense rather than in, in a written sense. And uh, the younger researchers in our institute have um, informed us that this is uh, a, a popular way for young people to access information about the EU. Um, the institute has also held podcast interviews with a series of visiting speakers among whom were Philip Lambert's The Green Perspective on the Future of Europe, uh, Franco-German Relations, uh, the Russian speaker, Dr. Dmitry Trenin on Russia and Europe, Dr. Constance stelson Muller on Transatlantic Relations in the Age of Trump, and Is Europe Facing a Democratic Deficit Recession? The German-Irish Forum, as mentioned by Jill, is uh, a very interesting initiative uh, in the overall uh, Irish-German um, uh, policy development uh, and projects. And last year, and again in May of this year, the German and Irish foreign ministries, <clears throat> together with the prestigious German think tank, the Foundation for Science and uh, Politik, and the Institute, joined together for a seminar over two days. 
It was hosted this year by the IIEA. <clears throat> On the agenda were German-Irish bilateral relations, the EU strategic agenda and transatlantic relations. Um, this was in line with the objective of creating closer relationship between the two, between the two countries. Lastly, as Jill has outlined, we have a very significant country profiles um, programme which has been extremely popular with the number of people who have accessed it at home and abroad. Looking forward then uh, finally to the next phase, uh, we will be developing with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. We will work on a programme focusing on the implementations of the commitments agreed by the heads of state and government at their meeting firstly in Cebu in Romania. Uh, as will be brought forward by the uh, strategic agenda to be adopted by the leaders in their meeting on 20th and 21st of, July, of June. Uh, this will set the overarching priorities that will guide the work of the EU over the next five years. So the IIEA will continue the work of assisting the government in shaping its policies in the implementation of the strategic agenda and in contributing towards a well-informed debate on the EU issues and challenges on the domestic front. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you all very, very much for that very valuable and informative contribution. And could I go to Senator Neil Richmond first, please? Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I thank you both for your contributions, and uh, particularly for the copy of Emerging Voices. Uh, I happen to know a couple of the authors, but I look forward to reading all of them. Most of them are on Twitter rel relatively actively as well, which is great. I suppose, um, I have three areas I want to touch on um, based on your remarks and indeed other remarks we've heard in these series of engagements <clears throat> and I'm happy for either of you to respond in due course. Um, you both mentioned the very, very strong relationship and the events that the IIEA itself has held with German partners uh, very recently and I was just wondering who are your strategic partners in the EU beyond that? What work does the IIA do on a European level um, in terms of engagement with other similar foundations and think tanks? Because um, I believe that is equally as important when it comes to the engagement. It's not just done on a, on a member state level, but it's every sector of society. And that leads, I suppose, to the second area. Um, I think it was Jill, you mentioned Ireland's role as a psychological insider and the very very strong work, particularly of our diplomatic corps uh, in recent years in terms of, indeed yourself, Ms. Cross and in terms of the work in Brussels and um, I suppose the strength of our permanent representation, indeed at a ministerial and council level as well, but you did make a reference to COSAC, but beyond COSAC, what, what can we as parliamentarians do to strengthen the reputation of Ireland at that level and indeed build those alliances what fora um, can we engage with, both EU fora and other, to build that alliance? And are we meeting enough? I know um, one thing that I've mentioned to other speakers, it, it's great that every six months we come together at COSAC uh, in, the, in the presidency, in the host presidency country, and indeed the chair will go as well to a different meeting. But where is the opportunity for parliamentarians to meet to discuss European issues? National parliamentarians, MEPs discuss issues at a European level. They're no longer members of their national parliament anymore. But what about parliamentarians? Where is the grand European Interparliamentary Agri-Food Committee or Home Affairs Committee mirroring the Council? Is that something that could be developed or, or where can we improve? And I suppose that the last one is I've identified, and I could be wrong and I'm open to correction, that there's three really big issues facing the EU over the next five years beyond Brexit. And I know it's very hard to look beyond Brexit, particularly in this country, and indeed our approach to these things might be determined to what happens at Halloween or beyond with Brexit. But if we look at the issues, and they might necessarily be, be as big to Ireland as, as other countries, but if we look at migration, we looked at the future of the European budget, particularly when it comes to the CAP, and indeed we looked at the, the climate emergency, who are Ireland's key issues, key allies for those three issues? You know, where do we have obvious... I know when we talk about CAP, and you've mentioned it, that the obvious relationship is with the French. Uh, and then we talk about migration, we're a little bit isolated um, because it doesn't impact us necessarily as... In, um, as, as whatever the term is, um, as immediately, sorry, as other member states like Greece and other southern Mediterranean companies. So, countries and that's I suppose those are my queries and those three key areas and um, once again to thank you very much for your presentations and indeed your ongoing work and the, the bevy of reports that you do produce and I try my best to read as many as possible. Uh, thank you Chair. Thank you very much Senator Deputy Sean Hyde. 
Um, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. I, I would like to thank the IIEA uh, for their presentation here today uh, and for the work that you do ongoing in relation to the European Union. I have attended many of your events up in North Great Georgia Street and they are always very interesting and produce a lively discussion among, among your members. So uh, thank you for that. It's interesting to um, listen to your uh, scientific approach, I think, to uh, alliance building. This is a subject which the committee have been uh, give, given some attention to uh, since the uh, Brexit referendum in the UK and um, just the, the whole scientific approach uh, to uh, this issue, I think, is, a, is an interesting perspective and, and one which we will uh, consider further. Um, I was delighted um, um, when you stated uh, that the um, practice of Irish uh, diplomacy and networking uh, by the Irish uh, Foreign Service um, is, is worthy of note. I think we can be very proud of our, our diplomats uh, at European Union level in advancing uh, our interests here in Ireland and indeed in advancing the interests of the uh, European Union. Uh, we've had the national uh, statement on the future of Europe. That's been debated in the Doyle uh, just before Easter in, in April, and obviously that's going to feed into the strategic agenda now uh, later this month at the European Council uh, meeting. I suppose I just have two questions, really. Uh, my main contribution is just to thank you for the work you're doing, but um, in, in relation to personal relationships, particularly at the, at the European Council level, what weight would you give to the to personal relationships at European Council level, you know, the relationships between um, he heads of state and heads of heads of government uh, when they meet, you know, the, the friendships that build up and so on. Do you think that's critically important or slightly important or whatever, apart from all the other work that's been done? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, you also mentioned there in, 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 the, in one of your contributions that, you know, the Franco-German alliance. Obviously, that's very central, and we all watch that uh, very carefully. But I, I, I often think that if, 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 our, if, our, if the Taoiseach of the day, whoever it is, um, you know, had a very good relationship with the German chancellor or the, or the French president, I think that's always in, in Ireland's interest. Um, um, but, so my, my question, you know, personal relations at European Council level, how important uh, is that? And also, just in your own experience, do you think that Ireland is considered a bit of a bold child in, in the European Union, you know, having regard, um, you know, to our banking crisis and the bailout and so forth? Uh, and also, are, are we considered problematic, you know, in relation to the Northern Ireland backstop and the, uh, the, the Northern Ireland border situation and so forth? I mean, we, we have been taking up a lot of their attention. Now, I, I, I do think that we punch above our weight and that we are uh, well respected, but do you think... Do you think some, some of our, 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 our allies or uh, colleagues, do you, do you think we are problematic uh, to them from time to time because of all these various issues that, that I mentioned? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, 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 I'm in an awkward position now because I was thinking of what I was going to say when I was sitting over there. So maybe our guests will forgive me if I continue with those thoughts because I, I, I just want to, like everybody else, to thank you for being with us uh, today and to, to welcome uh, your, your, your presentations. Uh, I think that uh, it goes without saying that the formation of alliances and friendship groups is more important now within the European Union than it ever was since the very beginning. And I think, to continue on the theme of my colleague, uh, uh, um, Deputy Sean Hawley, I think on the, on the contrary, I think that we're not so much a bold child, but we're seen as a child who might have a problem within the association of which we have become members, and whose problem might become the union's problem at a later stage, if not attended to. I think it's very important that we learn from this and that we use our position strategically uh, we, to, to intone the importance of, of forming alliances and listening to each other. <clears throat> and I think that's where, 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 where we can have alliances with bigger countries and smaller countries to our, our advantage and to theirs. In, order, in our case, to learn as to where they're coming from and where they're going and what their interests are. And, 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 and uh, at the same time, the exchange, we, for them to learn from us and for us to learn from them, and I think that's hugely important. I think that um, in the past, uh, from my 
experience and knowledge. And we, this phrase has become again and again and again, uh, and is part of the team across Europe at the moment, uh, bringing Europe closer to the people. I've always held the view that we have to bring the people closer to Europe. Because if the people of Europe don't have a commitment to the European strategy, then it's a waste of time. You can bring them as close as, you, as we like, it's not going to make any difference. So I think that um, by bringing the people closer to Europe, and that I think is reflected in the, in the opinion polls in this country, the people are closer to Europe because the people have now focused on Europe in a way that we haven't had to do since our membership began. And we are looking at Europe now in the way that we see it as part of us as opposed to the reverse. Our good friends, I don't want to be critical of our colleagues across the water in the UK, but in many, many situations that have emerged over the years, they have adopted the opposite approach, uh, that the European system should become more in line with what they have themselves or what way we should to be. In contrast to that, when uh, Ireland joined um, <clears throat> way back, the German uh, monetary system uh, aligned itself with the German monetary system uh, as opposed to, 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 to the, 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 uh, the, the uh, pound sterling. I think that was an important move. It brought us into the centre of Europe. It made us aware of the kind of territory that we had to operate in, and it also made them aware of a smaller country. And I think it was a very good, a very good exercise and very important, and I think that needs to continue. And I, I think as well, uh, if we are looking at the future, without the dialogue, between smaller countries and between smaller and bigger countries, I think we, we, we would make a huge, huge mistake. I've had, as, as we all have had, um, um, interaction with the, the Conrad Adenauer Foundation in the past, which did a great service to what was needed at that particular time. I think various countries across the European Union can now move on to a different challenge, meet the new challenge as it comes, as it comes as f face to face, and deal with it in a way that we haven't had to do before, ensuring that Europe, the European project, remains on stream. Because if it doesn't, and if one block is dislodged from that European brickwork at one at a time, then Europe will cease to be. The Europe, as, as was in, originally intended, will cease to be. And I am saddened to say and to hear from time to time, expressions to the effect, you know, that people want their freedom from Europe. I think they should look again at what that really means, because Europe has had one person in the last few weeks on television when interviewed said of the modern Europe that we have had since, nine, since the end of the Second World War, we've had the longest period of peace in the history of Europe. That's a strange thing to say, but it says it all. It says it all that the European project was the best, most important, and the single biggest peace project worldwide in the history, virtually the history of the globe. So I think that, that's something that we need to bear in mind in the future and conclude by simply saying this, that there is an obvious uh, need for a dialogue between all countries at the moment. I think that's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to make ourselves understood and to be understood. And I think, by the same token, as we proceed into the next phase of the Brexit era, I think we need to, be rec to, we need to, to recognise that we have a story to tell and we wish to hear the story of others. Uh, my colleague, Senator, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Lasker. You'll have to forgive me. Uh, uh, during your presentation, I was involved in legislation in the Senate, and um, I really haven't had time to um, go into great detail here. But one of the documents that before me is the specific character of Ireland's security and defence policy, and uh, reflections on neutrality, as mentioned. And one of the great challenges for us going forward relates directly to our defence policy. And that is the, we no longer fight wars on land in, in the same way as we once did. But Europe is at war. The continent, the European Union is at war. And it's at war in the cyber world. We have now the most vicious uh, criminals who are constantly working all day, every day to attack the European Union and every financial institution and any other institutions you care to think about from a software perspective. And in that context, Ireland needs to move its strategic defence policy into that area. We, need, we, 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 we have, if you want, cyber security 
element within the country, it's my view that we need to set aside this notion that Ireland is a neutral country. We were never neutral. We were militarily non-aligned, and that's all we ever were. And, and to suggest that our neutrality, or this notion of neutrality, is some way challenged by virtue of the fact that we involve ourselves in something as important as, as PESCO, that needs to be challenged. Because it is only with the might of the combined 27 uh, and the economic might that that will bring that we will be able to find the funding that's required to challenge the modern day war, which is the war of cyber security. And I think that if, if, if we're to do anything going forward, we need to identify precisely where, where Ireland is from a defence perspective. We then need to invest. It's my view that there should be a director of cyber security and perhaps a slightly broader um, um, uh, definition than just cyber security because there are other areas. Ireland's economy at the moment hosts approximately 40% of the world's soft uh, balance sheets. That is a massive amount of money in this country. But it is money that is footloose and it is money that can move if there's a challenge and move rapidly. And that rapid movement has the capacity to break this country. It has the capacity to destroy our economy in a very short space of time. So it's my view that we should be setting aside this notion of Irish neutrality and instead start talking about Ireland's alliance in the war in the cyber world. We, we, we're not talking about putting troops on the ground. We're not talking about some notion of a European army at some stage in the, fun, in the future. But very soon we will be contributing 280 million euros into the PESCO project. PESCO project is about 13 billion. And in the money we'll be putting in there, we have the capacity, we have the intelligence, we have the academic institutions in this country that are capable of providing the research and leading the world in cyber security. And this is something that I feel we should be trying to promote. This is something that I feel we should be working really hard on. But this needs an explanation to our citizens, because our citizens have been told for so long Ireland is neutral. We're a neutral country. We can hardly say we were neutral when we provided the weather forecast for D-Day. We can hardly say we were neutral when we provided safe flight paths over Donegal into Northern Ireland. We can hardly say we were neutral when we allowed uh, those who landed in the country from sunken ships or whatever to quietly walk back across the border. So let's get away from the nonsense of neutrality and instead talk about the real challenge coming forward in the world of uh, uh, what I call cyberspace and everything associated with it. And today is the first day that I have publicly spoken on this, um, but it's something that I am becoming extremely concerned about. Unless we have a director of cyber security, in my view, under the command of the military, reporting directly to the Taoiseach, Unless we do that and put that in place, I think we're really not at the races when it comes to exploiting what advantages there will be from PESCO. I would be looking for a, a, a coordinated group um, or a, um, a, a seconded group of academics uh, under the control of a military, a senior military officer, at least having a senior military officer at the front. It gives great confidence in the event of an attack when you see somebody with uniform coming out and speaking on it. But we need to bring academics, we need to bring the biz business world, both the uh, financial business world and the uh, production, if you want, uh, the producers of goods. Uh, we need to bring them all in under an umbrella group where they are um, managed where they are working together in order to source funding to develop better security systems in the area of software. And we need to have an immediate response system in place in the event of an attack. Because the world we live in today, there are attacks all day, every day. I thought 
information technology for 25 years. I worked mainly in the hardware side and to some degree in software with respect to Microsoft Certified Professional and CompTIA uh, qualifications. And at, at, at that time, we always spoke about software chasing hardware. Hardware was uh, sorry, hardware chasing software. Hardware was developing at a slower rate. Well, we now have a situation where software and negative software is developing at a rate much faster than we can keep pace with. And we need to put the resources in place. So I think I've said enough on it now. Thank you very much indeed. And I really am sorry I didn't get your full presentation today. Uh, this place is quite busy at the moment. So thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. You, you, you got enough of the presentation anyway. You went and made, made a good input yourself. Uh, 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 one of the other things that, that, that um, I think comes up in the context of, of dialogue today is uh, climate change. It's, it's the, the, the issue in vogue at the moment. And in the dialogue, we have to understand that we cannot expect uh, Italy, France and Germany to close down its motor manufacturing industry, for, ex for example, its engineering sector. We can't expect that. Um, neither can, should we be expected to close down our agri-food sector in order to comply. But there are other ways and means of doing it. And we have what to do is we have to understand ourselves. Uh, the, 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 the age within which we must operate and do so effectively, and so must our colleagues across Europe. So, in, a, in all of that, uh, I hand it over to your very good selves uh, to uh, respond. <coughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, members, uh, for your uh, responses. And uh, uh, it's becoming a very lively discussion uh, and very interesting. Uh, with regard to our partnerships uh, with other think tanks, um, and this is something quite close to my heart uh, because I'm now 20 years at the Institute and I've been trying to develop uh, links over the years. So uh, we in fact have three groups of partnerships. Uh, we are members uh, of an organisation called TEPSA, which organises uh, meetings twice a year before uh, the assumption of a presidency um, between uh, sister institutes uh, on uh, international and European affairs um, uh, across uh, the EU. Um, we are also involved with uh, foundations um, such as the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung and Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, so the Conservative and SPD, SPD foundations, and indeed the, the, uh, the Green Böll Institute in, um, in Germany as well. And these relationships go back over many years. We've uh, hosted uh, joint conferences uh, with these foundations and sometimes indeed with their support. Um, in the TEPSA context, uh, many of my researchers actually write for some of the think tanks. We have written a joint book uh, with the Institute in Croatia, um, and uh, we have a former director of uh, IFRI, uh, the French uh, think tank, uh, who has been writing blogs and is writing a, a long analytical paper for us on populism. Um, and uh, the final uh, group then are think tanks uh, that are outside of the TEPSA network, such as Chatham House in London, uh, the CEOR in London, um, the Federal Trust, um, and, uh, and many others which are specific to particular policy areas. There may be think tanks like, um, that focus on uh, economic areas like Bruegel. Um, and we have very regular contact with them. Our economists group invite over members uh, of these think tanks to discuss economic issues. Um, and uh, we have a very uh, active uh, interaction uh, with all of these think tanks. We each read each other's work as well, and that helps us to sort of see really where uh, other countries are coming from. So it is a very important element in the work that we're doing on the, on the future of Europe. Um, with regard to um, uh, some of the themes uh, that are of interest uh, and who are... Um, who our contacts are or who, are, uh, who we have relations with on particular themes such as migration and the budget and, and climate change. Um, I think the, the relations are differentiated. We've done a lot of work with Malta, with countries on the front line um, in the southern region who have uh, had uh, the experience in a, uh, in a manner that is much more direct than we have experienced uh, it in Ireland. And I think that uh, 
the concept of solidarity and responsibility are the two uh, sort of concepts that are most associated with what an Irish respo response could and should be. Um, we have uh, also looked very closely at the budget. I think that the um, negotiations now on the MFF are quite interesting and certainly you will see that if you go online to our uh, EU Explorer. Um, if you look at the options that are available, maintaining the same amount of money and the same priorities as we've had, or scenario two, increasing the amount of money that we had and keeping the same priorities, or scenario three, increasing the amount of money that we spend and increasing or perhaps changing the priorities uh, from traditional uh, priorities to accommodate issues such as counter-terrorism, the challenges of migration, the challenge of climate change. And uh, it's envisaged that uh, these uh, discussions will come to uh, a close under the Finnish presidency, um, if not uh, in the following uh, Croatian presidency, but I think well before the German presidency. With regard to parliamentary relations, um, I know just from talking over the years to Deputy Durkin in this context that uh, this committee has been very active in developing uh, relations with parliamentary friendship associations in the countries. I think that um, uh, perhaps there might not be a grand committee on home affairs uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the parliament where everyone will get the opportunity to engage. But I think the key is perhaps to break down the issues in justice and home affairs into smaller bite-sized pieces because it covers cyber security, counter-terrorism, um, fake news, uh, digital issues um, associated with privacy, fraud, um, human trafficking, um, how blockchain and artificial intelligence are going to infiltrate all areas, including uh, justice and home affairs. And I think what we have found in the Institute is that by engaging with rapporteurs from committees, rapporteurs who have written the expert reports, that we get a really good insight not only into the sort of c combined uh, consensus uh, that has been reached in a committee, but also to get a more differentiated view of where individual member states are coming from. Um, with regard to the uh, relationships, the personal relationships, I'll perhaps leave that one to Mary, who has the experience at first hand of um, dealing in a diplomatic context with the, uh, the European Council. But I think in general, the view in the Institute has always been that the more engagement we can have, not just at the highest level, but all the way through uh, the different levels in the EU institutions, be it in the Commission, in the Parliament, or indeed in the Court of Justice, um, that going to committees, um, making friendships, um, uh, having a direct relationship with someone um, it definitely yields a bonus. Um, whether Ireland is the bold child of the EU, um, I think we are now what the Germans would call the muster Knabe. We, in fact, are the, uh, the model child again uh, in the EU. Um, indeed, we had uh, our problems in the banking crisis, but I've just come back from uh, ver various visits in Berlin uh, over the past uh, few months since January. And um, I, I, I'm actually sort of delighted to see how Germany, in fact, respects the Irish people for the way that they dealt with the crisis and how in many ways um, the crisis led to a development of entrepreneurship where people lost their jobs, they suddenly tried to create new jobs um, and perhaps the digital area was one of the areas in which this was a possibility. Um, but I think that there is a very strong sense of cohesion and solidarity in, in Germany and in other states, but particularly in Germany, for Ireland's position regarding the backstop and that certainly is, uh, is music to our ears. Um, uh, on climate change, uh, just to say that uh, we are working with various countries. I mentioned earlier that we hosted a major conference last year, which about 500 people attended, on uh, solutions to climate change. 
Um, when I met with um, Ambassador Cruza, we were talking about what approach we would take, and I thought there's so much talk about the threats of climate change, about the planet burning, all the negative things associated with it, and that it might be interesting to adopt a more solutions-oriented approach. And so we came up with the idea of the Marché des Idées, a market of ideas, that we would have a, a conference which would produce a lot of ideas and solutions, and then we invited young and older people to enter a competition across the country to come up with ideas um, to provide solutions for climate change. So we had everything from musicians who were playing us the sound of a melting iceberg, perhaps not the most practical, uh, to apps that had been developed by younger people um, and uh, to uh, the young lady who in Dunleary has um, uh, started uh, work with her machine uh, to um, draw plastic out of, uh, out of Dunleary Harbour. Um, but just to say it was a very concrete example and likewise with the ESB in this autumn we're going to be hosting a, a climate uh, change event on looking uh, to designing a low carbon future where we're going to look at energy, but not just energy on its own, energy in cities, because the future seems to be drifting towards an urban future where climate change will play a really important role. We'll be looking at the design of traffic systems, the design of houses, um, and how to make buildings smarter and how to help people um, who are willing to invest personally in climate change uh, to achieve this. Um, uh, just finally to say on the digital side, um, we have been working uh, in our digital group and in our justice group on issues associated with cyber uh, security. I leave the defence issue to Mary, uh, who's an expert in this area, but just to say that um, uh, you know, we have been looking at issues such as cyber security, critical infrastructure protection, which is also very important, disinformation, um, and um, uh, many other areas such as ethics and governments, uh, governance of artificial intelligence and blockchain, which again are opportunities but also are hidden threats unless the frameworks are put in place, as you so rightly say, in advance uh, in order to uh, enable Ireland uh, to adopt an appropriate position. So thank you. Thank you. Well. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just briefly to go back to the, the first point, um, uh, working with other countries and the alliance. Uh, we have, as, as we mentioned, I think, in, in the um, presentation, uh, the so-called Hanseatic League. Uh, I think that's not particularly welcome at European level, but it's the Nordic and Baltic countries. And um, the areas that you mention, um, uh, Senator uh, Richmond, on the migration budget cap, climate change. We feel that those countries have a particular interest in, in that area and while some uh, have di would have different views, I mean for example the Dutch have uh, a somewhat different view of budget, they're, they have, <clears throat> they're much more in favour of budget uh, sustainability and, uh, and CAP, they may have a different view, but we are working uh, not only with countries where we have close uh, uh, ideas and relationships on the CAP, such as, for example, with France, but with other countries uh, that might have a different view, because the idea is, is to convince them of, uh, of our interests as well as uh, uh, those countries who understand that already. Um, so this, this would apply to budget, uh, climate change, migration, we're not in the forefront, so we have to make a point of uh, showing empathy and uh, understanding for those countries where this problem is, is, uh, is a huge issue for them. And indeed, right across the Union, uh, migration is still in the forefront of one of the issues uh, to be tackled. Um, uh, Deputy Hawhey mentioned relationships at the EU Council. Um, it, it's very much, it's, this is a very important issue, um, I feel, having um, sort of been involved for many years in uh, European and different councils. Um, and it goes not just at the European Council, but it's hugely important for us to have good relations 
uh, with the, the colleagues in each of the councils. Um, I've seen ministers crisscrossing the floor uh, to talk with other ministers. Uh, they have breakfast meetings before councils. They have dinners the night before. You have uh, groupings such as the Benelux, uh, the Nordics, uh, the Mediterraneans. Uh, we, we're a bit of an outlier in that. We don't have a, 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 a natural grouping. So it is really important that we, we set up contacts uh, at obviously the European Council level uh, but with other member states because when you're talking to uh, colleagues you can explain and also listen and it is absolutely uh, invaluable one of the most important things to do um, the, uh, as to whether we're bored uh, children, um, each country has its difficulties and it, it's, uh, I know we've, we feel we might be standing out uh, because of our banking crisis. Others have had banking crisis and ironically enough, uh, the Germans of course have come in, to, in for considerable criticism as to the way they handled the banking crisis. Was there too much austerity? So every country has, has its own problem. Uh, and uh, uh, the Northern Ireland backstop, of course, is, is a specific problem. But there's an issue of EU unity that is made here bigger than the backstop. Uh, and uh, for any country you talk to, and the Germans made this case with us when uh, we had the uh, discussions with them uh, two weeks ago, uh, the, the major issue for the EU27 is unity, maintenance of unity. And uh, I think they see that with the Northern Ireland backstop. A country has a problem. Other countries have had problems. Cyprus has had problems. Malta, we've had the money. But EU unity is paramount for other member states. Um, on, on defence policy, um, Senator Crockwell, yeah, um, we have, uh, I am a co-chair of the security and defence policy. <coughs> Um, a group in the Institute and we we have people coming through all the time to talk about these issues from other member states point of view uh, and how they see it and that includes and indeed in the in the next two weeks we have a cyber security expert because there is no doubt uh, that this is an area of security for every country uh, the uh, s cyber security and indeed in the leaders agenda uh, which will be approved and uh, which is uh, a draft of which I have here. The very first point in that uh, that the leaders will approve is protecting citizens and freedom and tackle hybrid threats and secure cyber security is on the very first objective of that. And the Institute, we also have our uh, cyber security committee as well. So we're very much in, in the forefront of, of dealing with that and getting experts in to talk to people um, here in Ireland about the threats as they see it internationally. Um, and the alliances, um, Deputy Chairman, the climate change, uh, yes, we have to understand other member states. They all have different issues in this regard and um, we have to put forward our uh, our particular priorities, but it has to be, I think, probably in a collaborative point, um, way of, of uh, dealing with climate change. We can't do it on our own, and um, again, that's one of the big uh, issues for the leader's agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, and sir, I might just add, add one small piece, if I may. I've just, I, I, I just, just hold on for a second now. Sorry. Just, just, sorry. Just, sorry, Leiden, wish to come in. Okay, okay, continue. Uh, I've just left a, a friendship group. Um, I'm chair of the uh, German uh, Irish friendship group, and the colleagues from Germany, uh, we were talking about the situation with uh, the north of Ireland, and it was really heartening to hear them, uh, if you want, place in order of importance the issues. And for them, the first and most important issue was the maintenance of the Good Friday Agreement. The second most important issue was the integrity of the single market. And after that, they felt that any measures that could be put in place for, if you want, the social development of the island of Ireland as we move forward in whatever guise that will be. Uh, and I thought that was really heartening to hear from people who are, if you want, twice removed, uh, if you take in, in, in geographical terms, uh, that that was their primary concern and that tomorrow morning they will be in Dundalk meeting uh, civic groups 
uh, from all communities to appraise themselves. And that's one of the great things that has happened. If there was to be a latent aspect to Brexit that we could not have imagined, uh, that has been one of them. It has been the familiarisation of foreign governments with the Irish problem, and I think uh, your own organisation has a lot to do with that as well, and the, how you feed into other uh, think tanks around the European C uh, Commission. So, I mean, I, I just think it's worth putting that on, on the record. Thank you. Thank you. We, we, we have to move on to our second uh, uh, item, and we'll suspend for a moment. First of all, may I thank you uh, both for uh, being with us uh, this afternoon. We're very privileged to have had two people of your experience and your commitment to European issues over a long number of years, and to hear from you firsthand is a privilege for us, and I'm sure of, mutual, of benefit to everybody in, 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 in the Chamber. So again, thank you very much. We have to suspend for just a few moments while our next uh, delegation takes its place, and that is uh, Noel O'Connell, Executive Director, and Daniel Cohan, Head of Policy and Advocacy, European Movement Ireland. And I would like to welcome, well, I think we're back in public session. We are back in public session. I'd like to welcome our, our guest speakers, um, Noel O'Connell uh, and uh, Daniel Cohan, uh, Executive Director and Head of Policy and Advocacy, uh, respectively, from the European Movement Ireland. Uh, and Ireland has been, um, since 1954, European Movement uh, Ireland has been working to strengthen the connection between all sectors of Irish society in Europe, and, and we will, of course, be familiar with their work, and I'm sure that they're familiar with our work as well. We have a common cause. And uh, uh, apart from everybody sort of standing aloof from each other and pointing the finger at each other, it's good to have organisations that engage with each other and, and, and uh, achieve results and success that way, and much better from the point of view of smaller countries like Ireland. So before we start, I have to remind uh, everyone the rules of privilege. Members are reminded of long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the Houses or any official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. By virtue of Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter, and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice and to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charge against any persons by um, entity or, or, uh, by name or in, or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. So, with that uh, citation, I don't wish you to be silenced or anything like that, but just so I throw it in there just for the, uh, to make it interesting, you know. Uh, so, uh, I would now call on, on uh, Mr. Connell uh, to make your opening statement, and then we will, we'll, we will continue. Thank you. Is more going to in Virginia, you have Lakur Lohar, Yen of Dave, August Guimi Gakra Arav, August Aaron Quish, the Leshen Togra, Fear Havok Dukshaw. So many thanks, thank you to you, uh, Chair, and members of the committee for your very kind invitation to de attend today's proceedings to discuss Irish public opinion on and engagement in the European Union. 
As Executive Director of European Movement Ireland, I'm uh, delighted to present before you again and particularly pleased to be joined here today by our Head of Policy and Advocacy, Daniel Kuhan. Daniel has recently returned to Ireland after spending many years working on the continent, focusing on a variety of policy areas, uh, defence in particular, and with that extensive experience, he will uh, chair, share some valuable insights indeed into some of these topics and how Ireland is perceived by our fellow EU member states. As, as members of the committee are no doubt aware, uh, European Movement Ireland is Ireland's longest established not-for-profit membership organisation dedicated solely to European issues founded in 1954. We are a non-partisan not-for-profit membership-based organisation and what we do and what we are about is to develop that connection between Ireland and the rest of Europe <coughs> to increase awareness, understanding and debate of European issues here in Ireland. It is a privilege and indeed a vital part of our work programme to engage with all members of the Oireachtas and indeed in particular this committee. Let me start firstly by congratulating this joint committee for initiating this important and timely debate on how best to engage citizens on the issue of our EU membership, as well as the vital subject of alliance building for Ireland within the European Union. These are topics which demand much more focus and attention over the coming years, particularly in light of a European Union which does not contain our nearest neighbour, the UK, as a member state. Through being an engaged member state willing to regularly debate EU issues in our national parliament, as well as hearing a range of perspectives and evidence from our EU partners, there is certainly um, both opportunity and room for Ireland to work to increasing our effectiveness at a broader EU level. Reasoned and robust debate as a country is crucial to enable Ireland to clarify and sophisticate our position on EU policy areas as too is hearing where other member states indeed stand on these very same issues. We believe that this combination will allow us to act both maturely and confidently at an EU level as we approach the next, chap next chapter of the Union's history with indeed a new parliament and a new commission coming into, into office this year and a union of 27 rather than 28. Such exercises are useful in identifying potential avenues of alliance building over the coming years. As an organisation, we in European Movement Ireland have been and continue to remain extremely active in calling for Ireland to continue its robust engagement with the Future of Europe process through indeed supporting the work of this committee on the subject, as well as working closely with Minister of State for European Affairs, Minister McEntee, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade to organise the Irish Government's citizen consultation process on the future of Europe, and indeed working very closely as well with both the European Commission and the European Parliament offices here in Ireland on this vitally important topic on the future of Europe. Um, Chair, if I may, at European Movement Ireland, we have found our recent process of, of travelling the length and breadth of the country to debate the future of Europe um, inspiring, invaluable and incredibly important. Be it from Cavan to Cork, we gained a huge level of insight as to how people in Ireland connect at a local and regional level with our EU relationship. This in turn also helped us as an organisation in thinking about we should, how we should work best to communicate Europe to citizens and that ensure that debates here in Ireland on EU affairs are as inclusive and practically relevant as possible to people. That value of participative democracy, of going out and, and going to different towns and, and regions around the country and engaging with people and crucially listening to what they had to say was vitally important. If alliance building is to be productive and benefit to the Irish public, we must first endeavour to ascertain what people in Ireland think about the very issues which Ireland is trying to develop alliances on. This process has led us to question and perhaps explore in greater detail some assumptions we might have previously held about, for example, Irish attitudes to defence cooperation, as well as reaffirming others, such as Irish positivity towards remaining an active and committed and engaged member of the European Union. These are issues which we chose to explore further in our annual independent poll on Ireland's relationship with the EU, 
which, uh, which members of the committee should have previously received a copy of, I've no doubt. Um, and with the health warning that I'm sure members of this committee can no doubt appreciate, we acknowledge that although polls are but a snapshot of sentiment at any one time, they do nonetheless serve as a useful barometer of people's opinions on various issues. We first began commissioning these polls in 2013 to coincide with Ireland holding the rotating presidency of the Council of the EU with the goal to ascertain the views of people in Ireland on a range of issues concerning Irish-EU relations. So since then, every year, Red Sea have been commissioned to conduct this Ireland and the EU poll on an annual basis. And in fact, some of those questions in the very first poll we continue to ask each year, which really shine a light on how the views and opinions of Irish people have evolved over time, but it has also helped us to track and annotate these, these views and these evolving opinions every year. Last year's poll showed positivity for our, Ireland's membership of the European Union at an impressive high. So it is perhaps maybe a little unexpected, but very welcome to see that support has risen yet again this year in 2019. A couple of weeks ago, 93% of those people polled thought that Ireland should remain a member of the EU. This figure is consistent with other polling on Irish attitudes towards Ireland remaining a member state of the EU. For example, a Kantar poll in April earlier this year found that 91% of Irish people would vote to remain if an in-out referendum were to be held, whilst a Eurobarometer poll in October 2018 found that 92% of Irish people felt that the country had benefited from EU membership. So the most recent polls all showing incredibly high figures and support for Ireland remaining in the EU, well over 90%. Since Brexit, it is fair to say that there has been a rise in support for the EU across many member states, as some of the effects and indeed the challenges and the complexities of a member state leaving the EU become ever more clear. In our first annual poll in 2013, we saw support for EU membership at 81%. As I just mentioned, we are now at 93%. This perhaps Brexit balance or Brexit dividend, as it were, has helped increase support for the EU across the different member states, not only here in Ireland. But we would argue that Irish support for the EU goes indeed much deeper than Brexit. And I will now pass over to my colleague Daniel to speak more to that point. And he'll also concentrate on some of the other questions we asked and posited in this year's poll. Some of the results which might tell us about some of the policy areas which we might seek to build alliances with other like-minded member states. Thank you. Uh, Daniel? Um, we have to know that we have to know that we have to know that And as Noel said in our poll, there has been what's called a Brexit bounce, a Brexit dividend. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But we actually asked a specific question about Brexit in our poll, uh, whether or not Brexit has improved your opinion of the European Union. And the answer was a strong agree with Brexit improving one's opinion of the European Union, 58%, but arguably was actually not as high as one might expect, given you know how strong EU support for Ireland's national interests have been during the Brexit story. Uh, I think Brexit has made us all very aware of how valuable the EU is for our daily lives, um, even more so than before. So perhaps another way to think about all this is that the Brexit bounce was building on something that was very strong already. Irish support, as Noel said, in 2013 for membership in our first poll was at 81%. It went up to 93 this year, which is staggeringly high. Uh, but the support for membership was already high, long before Brexit, long before Brexit was even being seriously discussed or debated. Um, and I think that's worth bearing in mind, that you know, Brexit is building, the Brexit effect is purely um, extenuating something that was very strong already, uh, exacerbating the feeling that was there already. And this is borne out as well in other questions in our poll, uh, for example, we asked a question if Irish people would be willing to contribute more to the EU budget. Now, if people are willing to pay more for something, that usually tells you that they like it. 
Uh, and in this case, again, 58% agreed with the statement that they would like to pay more, contribute more to the EU budget to continue to get the benefits of membership. So it's very clear that if you pay in, it's very clear what Ireland has received from the EU, and it's very clear that we not only want to receive those benefits ourselves continuously, we want everyone to continue to receive those benefits. So I think that is very telling that uh, respondents in Ireland are willing to pay more into the budget, which is not always the image, it has to be said, of Ireland in other EU member states, because we're seen to have benefited so much, but now we're willing to pay more. Similarly, given its 20 years since the common currency, the euro was launched in 1999, we asked how do Irish people feel about that? Has the euro been a positive thing for Ireland, uh, was the question. And it's an extremely high uh, positive result, uh, an impressive 86% agreed with the statement. Now, I find that I've been away, as Noel said, for the last 22 years, even before the euro was launched. So there were still poons when I left. Um, Ireland has had a very mixed economic experience over the last 22 years. I mean, very up and down, let's say, a roller coaster, some would say. And yet the euro is seen as an incredibly positive thing for Ireland. And I, I think that's interesting in itself that there's clearly, you know, again, from outside, some people would say, in the UK, it's very common to blame the euro for the economic problems in Ireland and Italy and Greece and Spain and Portugal and so on. Well, that's not how Irish people feel about it, it seems. That's not the story of those of us who use the euro. So I think that's worth bearing in mind. We also asked as well about openness to cooperation in a few more sensitive policy areas like tax. I know we all know there's a very interesting debate about tax in Ireland, in the world, at the OECD, for example, with the United States, with France, and so on. Uh, and this really certainly surprised me, I think surprised all of us uh, at European Movement Ireland, that 50%, fully half of respondents, said that they were open to more cooperation on tax. Now, that's a very open statement, you know, fiscal policy, or are we talking about tax rates, tax bases, corporate tax specifically, digital tax specifically? No. It was a very broad question, but it does suggest that there might be more openness to discuss tax at the EU level amongst the Irish population than is sometimes perceived, certainly from outside. Now, we also asked about security and defence, and we asked the same question now for the third year in a row. Uh, we asked if Irish people are they positive towards more cooperation. Should Ireland be part of incre increased co cooperation in security and defence? And for the third year in a row, we got practically the same answer. Again, around the 58% mark. Uh, this year it was 58. Last year it was 57. In 2017 it was 59. That's a striking pattern. Again, it flies in the face of the image. Uh, that some people have of the Irish debate around these subjects and indeed sometimes the image people have of Irish activity on these subjects. But actually this result is lower than some other opinion polls on this subject. If you look for example at Eurobarometer which asks EU-wide and people in Ireland for example nearly two-thirds a year ago said they were for cooperation, EU security and defence cooperation. Now, it's a slightly different statement, but I think you get my point. Mm. But I think it's also worth pointing out there's a big difference, and obviously a lot depends on how you frame the question. If you ask people do they want to cooperate with others more, they're generally more positive. If you ask people do they want to sign up to an EU army, they're generally much less positive as was shown by the recent RTE Red Sea poll, uh, which asked a number of questions about neutrality and had a specific question about joining a European Armed Forces, which of course is not on the table, there is no such proposal, but only a third responded positively. So clearly uh, citizens uh, in the Irish public know the difference between cooperating with others as we do at the UN level as well, and uh, joining an EU army. But I think it's very important that that distinction is made. It's sometimes missed in the public debate. We saw this during the European Parliament election campaign as well. Uh, there is a difference between a European army run by Brussels 
and governments cooperating together on peacekeeping or on having better capabilities and equipment for their armed forces. Two very different questions. But it seems that Irish respondents know this difference, and that's quite clear. Now, to move it on to alliance building, what does all this mean? So, as I said, the Brexit dividend, as it were, is only a small dividend on top of it's a small extra interest rate on top of what was very strong already namely Irish support for remaining in the EU at 81% in 2013, 93% now. And there is a general openness to more cooperation, to building on what's there. Uh, but what does this mean for alliance building post-Brexit? Um, Ireland is already very aware that it needs to build alliances, coalitions. This is something we tend to be quite good at, joining coalitions. Everyone knows we're already part of the new Hanseatic League, as it's called, which is led by the Netherlands with Nordic and Baltic states. That's a policy-specific coalition on the Eurozone. It might evolve into something broader. We'll see. I think it's worth debating whether Ireland wants to be involved in something broader. And that actually brings me to the bigger point. Ireland will have a huge structural disadvantage after Brexit. We will no longer have a next-door neighbour in the EU. We are not a part of a regional grouping like most EU member states are. If you think about the Baltic states, you think about the Nordic states, you think about Benelux, you think about Visegrad, and so on. Uh, this is a major disadvantage uh, for Ireland. And Based on some recent studies, for example, by the European Council on Foreign Relations, which I highly recommend, on coalition building and on cohesion, only a few EU members consider Ireland a potentially important partner. And they include Cyprus and Malta, small islands like ourselves. So I think that's worth reflecting on. I think that suggests we have a major alliance building challenge ahead of us after Brexit. All EU members, all EU members will try to influence France and Germany. And I think it's wonderful that the Department of Foreign Affairs is investing much more in, that, in those relationships, like the consulates in Frankfurt, in Lyon, as proposed. All of that is great. However, maybe, at least based on how I analyse what came from the European Council on Foreign Relations, we should actually be investing much more in relationships with countries like Denmark, and Portugal. Now, they're not the first two countries one might think of, right, if we're thinking about alliance building and given our structural weakness, and I want to stress that structural weakness, why do I pick Denmark and Portugal? Well, Denmark joined uh, the common market as it was then at the same time as we did, along with the UK in 1973. It's also had some history with referendums on EU treaties, like ourselves. It has very similar interests in global trade and agriculture. There's a natural alliance of interest there, and there's an openness in Denmark to Irish ideas. I would say the same about Portugal. Very similar interest to Ireland on trade and on agriculture. Also, by the way, let us not forget, shares a time zone with Ireland. Also has a very strong Atlantic identity. In other words, we need to start thinking a little bit outside the box, we need to start thinking a bit more strategically, not just tactically. We're extremely good at joining coalitions on very specific policy-specific areas, but we need to think a little bit more over the medium term, the long term, and strategically. Partly because, as Catherine Day, the former Secretary General of the European Commission, noted to this committee, and she very elegantly noted this, I'll be more blunt, uh, when she spoke here on April 3rd, Ireland, frankly, has a very defensive image. A very defensive image amongst the rest of the EU. Very quick to say no on corporate tax discussions or some defence discussions or other issues. Very slow to initiate a policy idea of its own. In fact, I can't think of one right now. I'm sure someone will correct me or I'll be criticised for saying that, but that's fine. Um, and I think we have to bear in mind as well, we've been shown incredible solidarity on Brexit. The other 26 governments of the European Union have shown Ireland incredible 
solidarity on the backstop. We can debate why. I'd be very happy to debate this. You know, there, there, there's a whole host of geopolitical, geoeconomic and pure values reasons why that's so. You know, the others do care about a peace process. The EU is a peace process, let us not forget. But someday, some of those same members may ask for that solidarity to be reciprocated. You know, and some of these countries are not members of NATO, like Sweden or Finland, who are facing serious aggression from Russia, whether it's military or non-military. So are we prepared to support them on their vital nat national interest of peace and security in the same way that they have supported us on our vital national interest of peace and security? A final challenge will be to develop Ireland-based knowledge of the EU and depend, frankly, less on English language analysis from the rest of the non-EU Anglophone world. That's going to be a big <coughs> challenge for us. Only one Irish newspaper, for example, has correspondence in the main EU capitals beyond Brussels, Paris, Berlin, Rome, Madrid, namely the Irish Times. We have, there's a lot of potential, let's say, there's a lot of growth potential to have Ireland-based knowledge. And this weakness, actually, I would argue, could become a strength. After Brexit, Ireland will be the largest uh, EU member where English is an official language, Malta being the other. Um, and of course Ireland will want as close uh, a UK EU and a US EU and indeed an Australia EU and Canada EU relationship as possible. It's in all our interests. That's clear. In other words, there's great potential, great potential for Ireland to position itself as an obvious partner for those in the UK, in the US, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand and so on who share this objective of better UK-EU, transatlantic, indeed global relationships. And this in turn would help us strengthen at a time, let's be honest, when things have been difficult between the UK and Ireland recently, this would help rebuild trust and relationships with the UK and indeed strengthen our relationships with the US and others even more. So in sum, while Brexit has been and will remain very challenging for Ireland, uh, the post-Brexit EU will be even more challenging for Ireland in many ways. Thank you, Daniel. And I might, and I might just, uh, Car Carilic, if I could just make some final concluding remarks to follow on from Daniel. Bring in the, the, our our, our, our um, members. Uh, no, we'll, we'll bring you back in for that, don't no, worry. Uh, bring you back in for that. Senator Neil Richmond. Oh, sorry, thank you, Les uh, Gaelic. Um, uh, thanks. Usually I get accused of depressing people when it comes to future relations, but I think, uh, Daniel, you've definitely given us uh, a number of very clear challenges, and very stark and very welcome, to be frank, and it uh, feeds into a lot of the work we're doing here. Um, I suppose I had a few questions based on that. Um, I suppose uh, the first is uh, direct to your challenge. What policy should we be initiating, or where is the scope to initiate particular policies? Um, and investing in relations, it's a great term. Um, one of the great achievements um, of the current government, and indeed the previous government going back, is through the difficult years and the austerity years, as we maintained our diplomatic network throughout the European Union, and indeed that uh, returned and the strengthening of our perm rep in Brussels has been very welcome. But how beyond that do we specifically invest in relations? And indeed, are we taking... It's quite evident we've, we've a great deal of solidarity and um, you know, I met with a delegation from the Bundestag this morning, but are we taking that solidarity for granted? And how far will that solidarity get to us if, ideally, we move to the second phase in talking about the future relations in Brexit 
or indeed depending on what day of the week which is more likely if we face the challenges of a no deal scenario and everything that that comes um, do we take that for solidarity on some of the country specific um, questions um, but it's interesting that both the Danish and Portuguese Parliament have sent delegations over to us very recently, yeah. European Affairs Brexit Committees, and uh, I acknowledge um, everything that you've remarked upon. I suppose, I suppose that the two, and I'm not picking issues because I think we do have great relationship with both, but I suppose the obvious challenge with deepening relations with, with Portugal in particular is the language barrier. Um, Irish people, as we know, don't have a great ability in a second or a third language. Um, we have a particular weakness in somewhere like Portuguese. We do we may have French speakers, we may have German speakers, but bar a few of my friends who are married to people from Portugal or Brazil, I don't know anyone who knows any Portuguese, to be honest. Um, and how do we work on that? How do we improve that? Um, and how do we remove that as an obstacle for developing that particular strategic alliance? And then I suppose with the Danes, I suppose it's a, it's a far more political point, and I don't expect you to go into the politics of Denmark too much, but there is, like the UK with Denmark, a lingering Euro scepticism. And we see that reflected in the recent election results that whilst the Social Democrats have come back into power in Denmark, it's a very different Social Democratic Party to, say, Social Democratic parties in, in Southern Europe or otherwise, where migration was a much bigger factor. Um, and indeed, whilst we have great commonalities with the Danes and really, really warm relationships, are there areas, particularly in agriculture, where we are perhaps more competitors? than necessarily allies, and how do we get over that yeah. and make sure that we we get the both of that strategic alliance? And I suppose you mentioned the French and the Dutch, or the French and the German, and I, I do fundamentally believe that we do need to maintain the strength of our relationship, and if everyone's looking to improve that alliance, so be it. Um, the Franco-German alliance will dominate the, the EU post-Brexit more so than it has in a long time, and that's just, just a fact of life. And I think we are lucky that we do have such a... Um, a strong relationship with those two member states um, at a diplomatic level indeed and a political and, and parliamentary level but I suppose I would have always seen a very strong um, location and, or a relationship not necessarily but definitely on a political but on a governmental level but also as a, an internal political level with the Benelux countries mm -hmm. so again to go party political when I attend meetings on behalf of Fine Gael or Young Fine Gael our natural allies, allies were always the Christian Democrats from the Benelux regions it is literally who we sat beside for dinner and we were able to work together on a, a range of common motions in terms of what we believed Europe to be in terms of a union of values and law and order as well as um, an economic union and a social union and I think they're one and I note that the the Dutch Royals are, in, are, are visiting Ireland at the moment and I'm very lucky to be attending the event with however many other people tomorrow evening and I met the President today. I still think those are two relationships that, again, I go back to my earlier point, we can't take anything for granted in terms of solidarity and we can't take for granted um, the relationships with the, with the Germans, the French, the Dutch and the Belgians or indeed any of our European partners because I would maintain we have really good relations with all the other 26 and indeed the UK as a departing member state. Um, but those were a few thoughts, questions, and I don't know what else that I had, and I'll leave it back to you. Let's go. Thank you. Um, uh, Deputy Sean Hawley. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I'd just like to thank European Movement Ireland for their presentation, uh, both speakers here. Um, you're, I know you're regular attenders at, at this uh, committee meeting. Um, and to thank you for the work that you've done in relation to the future of Europe and the consultation which took place uh, throughout the country. I think it was a very useful exercise in engaging the, uh, the citizens in that process uh, so that I think uh, everybody felt part of the uh, agenda uh, in planning a new future for, for Europe. And I note that the, the government have since published the national statement on the future of Europe, um, which it got a, a short debate in the Dáil just before Easter in April, uh, and I guess that now feeds into the strategic agenda. So just to thank you for the work that you've done on that. Lots of food for thought in relation to future alliances, very hard-hitting contribution from Daniel there, uh, which we will have to consider very seriously in, in our work here at, at this committee. Just in relation, uh, I, I know, Noel, you were cut off there about turnout in the European Parliament elections, because I see that in your contribution here, in your written contribution. So the turnout in, 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 in Ireland was, was down and below the European average for, for, for the first time. Um, um, certainly as somebody who was canvassing in those elections, 
you know, the local elections seem to be more important to the to the voters when you're on their doorstep. I can't think of that any particular voter raised a European issue with me on the doorstep. So that's a bit disappointing. So the, the, we're going to have to get people more engaged with the European Parliament elections. I don't know how we do that. Uh, and when you consider that European issues were on the top of the uh, national agenda, uh, that, that is a little bit disappointing. Um, and I just... Uh, in your experience, I just want to ask a, a, a question in relation to the new European Parliament that's been elected. Obviously, there, uh, what's your thoughts on that? There hasn't been a, a swing to the populace, uh, to the far right, as expected, or certainly uh, to the extent that was ex expected. Um, it seems now that there, you know, there's a kind of a, a very diverse, fragmented centre. You know, with the Greens uh, uh, um, doing particularly well uh, throughout Europe as well, um, and now obviously various alliances are going to have to be formed in relation to the groupings and and the the you know the filling of the positions and the role of the European Parliament and that and and so forth. So, what's your your view generally on the new European Parliament and how it's going to function and will it be effective? Yeah, thanks. Good evening. Uh, now, uh, before uh, we should explain to you explain that the members have gone before and after during the course of the debate that the Senate is sitting and votes arise and they have to go to vote, otherwise uh, a problem rises. And I know you have a, a, another paragraph or two to, to, to divulge to us just yet. Can I, can I just mention, can I just mention uh, bef beforehand um, that I note the way the debate is moving in the last few weeks in relation to Europe and a quid pro quo for one support or another support. Not sure that that's the, the right way to go. I think Europe uh, had a test, first of all, in relation to the economic crash. And there's a debate as to whether Germany went the right way or not. But don't forget that Germany had history in the qualitative easing uh, in, in, a previous, in a previous era, and it wasn't a happy one. And they were obviously very reluctant to go that direction again. Not everybody understands that, uh, but, but it's a fact of life. I think the most important thing in the recent events was that all the European 27 member states stood together. My belief is that they stood together because they recognised the writing on the wall. The writing on the wall is do we need, do we want a Europe in the future, or do we want a disjointed Europe, a two speed Europe, or a broken up Europe? And having listened to the comments of some people who say freedom from, from, from Europe, we want freedom from Europe. Well, what is freedom? Can we define freedom? And what, 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 what is our state of mind when it comes to determining, you know, some people's freedom might be another, another person's incarceration? So we, 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 we need to, to know that we have uh, some experience ourselves in those areas as well. And the last point I want to make is, is, is this, is that... Um, I believe that, uh, for instance, in relation to taxation and security and so on, I believe we, we do have responsibility and we, we have no difficulty debating that. The, diff the problem is, uh, the, well, it's not a problem. The fact of life is that we are not in the centre of Europe. Geographically, we're not in the centre of Europe. And we are at a disadvantage, particularly so in the, in, in the aftermath of Brexit. We are on the fringe. And the countries on the fringe tend to be like the analogy of the wheel that I used on the last occasion here. The people on the outer rim usually get to feel the draft first and, and the heat last. And the point about it is this, the point about it is this, that uh, we need to learn from that as well because European history, European history, we've learned, we can learn a lot from that as well, uh, in the way things have happened in the past and the way things can, can, can lead in the future. So I think all we need is we need recognition and we need to proceed in a, in, in a unified fashion, supporting each other uh, as opposed to poking uh, the, the bricks out of the wall uh, in order to improve the circumference of the wheel. It hasn't always worked in the past. Thank you. Back over. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Durkin. Um, absolutely. And, um, you know, thank you and to, to, uh, to, to Deputy Holly and Senator Richmond for, for, for your comments and inputs and, and, uh, and Senator Crockwell. Absolutely. You touched on a really important point there, um, in terms of European history. And I think it goes to demonstrate and illustrate the importance, if ever it was needed, of how crucial the subject of history is in terms of it being on the curriculum, but I appreciate that probably isn't a subject for this, this particular committee, but it's one I think that uh, we do need to bear in mind and, and consider. 
Um, what I might do is we might do our, our cork me's two-hander. We might continue the winning formula. Um, I'll just touch upon some of the topics that Senator Richmond picked up and, and address uh, 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 Deputy Hawhey, some of your really val valid points, and anything that I don't or that I omit, I'm sure my colleague Daniel will 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 perform an excellent sweeper uh, uh, on on that policy side of things. But um, uh, Senator Richmond raised an important point, just in terms of languages and the language barrier, and this is something that we are in incredibly exercised um, in EM Ireland, along with our uh, uh, colleagues and partners in the Commission and the Parliament and, and obviously the Department of Foreign Affairs and the Minister, that whole area of the EU Jobs Committee and the work of encouraging and promoting a career in the European institutions as a, as a viable and valuable uh, career pipeline and career opportunity. There isn't, um, I mean, it is concerning that, that Irish pipeline and that's why I think concerted efforts that are ongoing to ensure that languages and language abilities are improved. But you're, you're, you're absolutely right. It, it, is a, it is a challenge and, and something that I think more uh, focus and more support needs to be given to. And I know the, the Perm Rep as well in Brussels are doing huge work in this regard. But we need to, uh, we need to I suppose, in, figure out creative ways to enhance our collective efforts to ensure that, that Irish presence at all levels and at all institutions continue to, to play the important role that they have to. Um, Deputy Hawhey, you, you touched upon the Future of Europe debate and agenda and, and, and thank you for all your ongoing um, support and engagement on that. And like literally when we were in places like uh, Letterkenny, down in Cork, in, in, in Navan, in, in Kilkenny, in, in Wexford, and, and it was just the different topics and um, agendas that people were debating reinforces how important it is to actually listen to what people are saying and to try and um, get, get people's views and perspectives, things like, uh, as Daniel touched upon, defence, but the whole area of sustainability, mm -hmm. of climate change, that was uh, the consistency in the level of concern and worry about climate change and sustainability was incredible, whichever, whichever venue we were for our Future of Europe dialogue. Um, but, and it is important, I suppose, for us, um, and I think this is something that, that we in European Movement Ireland, in terms of that Irish engagement with the EU, it is clear, and I don't have to tell this committee that, but it is clear that we cannot be, we cannot be complacent. If the experience of, of what is happening um, across the water is anything to show, and if, de if Brexit has demonstrated anything, is, is the impossibility of reversing over 40 years of negative discourse and, and diatribe. That concerted engagement about here in Ireland, about how we would like to shape our European Union membership must be a constant. Um, we have to view this engagement with, with our, our citizens as an ongoing process rather than a separate standalone event if we are to truly develop, articulate and defend a comprehensive Irish vision of what type of a European Union we want to, we want to live in. Um, and in terms of the European Parliament elections, Deputy Hawhey, I, I can certainly empathise with the challenges. I think we were one of the few organisations that invited all 59 candidates standing for election in the European Parliament to participate in a candidate debate um, and to present their views and perspectives on to why they were standing for election as a member of the European Parliament. And we did this in a series of three constituency debates and engagements. And it absolutely was a challenge to pivot the discussion and the debate, I guess, to perhaps some of the non-local issues and to focus on some of the, the European issues. But the, it nonetheless was a really important and worthwhile exercise uh, to do. What was somewhat disappointing, I guess, for us um, this time around in 2019, uh, that voter turnout in the European Parliament elections uh, dropped from 52% to 49.7. And that is the first time, as I, th I think I have said in my remarks, that is the first time in 25 years that the Irish turnout was below the overall EU average, which has stood at 51%, which that was, again, reversing the overall EU declining turnout since the first European Parliament elections. So in terms of the composition of the European Parliament, I think what we're welcoming on one hand the increase in turnout um, across the EU to 51%, which is encouraging. Um, it shows a sign, I would argue, of a greater citizen engagement, notwithstanding the challenges that people have said in terms of populism. 
Um, but also, I think for us here in Ireland, it is disappointing that it dropped and it is below that EU average. So our civic objective and our responsibility, I think, must be to reverse and to work very constructively with, the, with this committee and other partners to reverse this decline at the next European elections. And that goes on to, I think, the, what we're debating here today, Cahir, look, just in terms of alliance building. It's not just an activity by our, our political leaders, by our politicians, by members of our national parliaments, but this is a, a whole of Ireland approach, um, whether that's us as, as civil society organisations, as NGOs, as business groups, as trade associations, as chambers of commerce. Um, I think there's a collective onus and responsibility on us all to include all sectors of Irish society in this dialogue and this engagement and this debate on relationship building. And that's something that we in European Movement Ireland are very actively doing with our counterparts throughout the European Movement International Network, which has a presence in over 40 different countries, going as far as Azerbaijan. But also I know that a lot of other organisations and trade associations, we try and support and amplify their work as well, and that's, and that's a very important aspect of their work. So those are just some of my initial thoughts to the comments, and I'll hand over to Daniel if I forgot sure. anything. <laughs> Thank you. I know Daniel will, 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 will think even things of, 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 of his own initiative. Well. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Building on what Noel said, I very much want to reiterate, actually, the, first thing, the last thing Noel said as my first remark. Having an all of Ireland approach with the whole of Europe should be the basic principle. Now, obviously, I personally would love it if the Department of Foreign Affairs could be doubled as quickly as possible. We have a very small capacity diplomatically. Now, thankfully, we manage to have diplomats in every EU member state, and indeed most members of the Council of Europe. Not every EU member state has that. Uh, but, and I, for example, we're opening an embassy in Kiev, I understand, next year, or maybe sooner. Um, but we must keep up that capacity. Uh, in fact, we need to increase that capacity in all member states. All member states are all our partners. This is not only about France and Germany. But looking beyond what the government can do, exactly as Noel said, organisations like ourselves, which have EU-wide, indeed Europe-wide networks, that's invaluable. Whether it's business networks, trade union networks, civil society in general, sectoral, whatever it may be. So we need an all-of-Ireland approach with the whole of the EU. And as we know the old saying, the old Shanachal, Antein Nachullailer Thotni Fowler de Veglik, the small man or the weak man, or the not-so-strong man, uh, has to be clever. So we have to think cleverly about where we put our resources. Uh, I'm not imagining the Department of Foreign Affairs will get doubled by next year. Uh, I'm hopeful they will, though, have more resources over the next decade. In the meantime, we need to think cleverly where to put our resources. And that's exactly why I made the point <clears throat> excuse me, earlier <clears throat> about Portugal and Denmark. And I did it slightly deliberately to kind of encourage people to think hard about this because everybody, all the other 24, not including ourselves, France and Germany, will want to talk to Paris and Berlin. Germany has more neighbours than Meath, my beloved Meath, and that's a lot of neighbours. Uh, that's a lot of people that you need to talk to and try and keep happy, just territorially. Uh, France likewise. Um, we're isolated, relatively speaking. We're the Aran Islands in that respect, right? Um, we need to think very cleverly. So if you can't talk to the main person, you talk to their advisor or their best friend. The thing is, in the case of France and Germany, their best friends are already pretty busy. The Netherlands would be an obvious place. Sweden would be another obvious place. But Sweden is at the heart of Nordic cooperation. The Netherlands is at the heart of Benelux cooperation, also leading the Hanseatic League. And suddenly you end up with Denmark and Portugal, where maybe who are getting less love, to put it bluntly, from their neighbours. Uh, Spain doesn't talk as much to Portugal as it probably should. Sweden doesn't talk as much to Denmark as it probably should, nor does the Netherlands. Well, why don't we? Why don't we? because our only kind of natural allies are Malta and Cyprus. And I want to keep Malta and Cyprus on our side, as it were, but I'd like us to build a bit more of a network. 
uh, an Irish network, an all of Ireland approach with the whole of the EU. Just to respond to the specific, specific question about the European Parliament from Deputy Hawhey, which I think is a great question. The next European Parliament is going to be very complicated. As you know, your own group, Deputy Hawhey, Aldi, with Fianna Fáil, the Alliance Party, Northern Ireland and so on, are being reconfigured now with the accession of President Macron of France and his Renaissance group. Um, and indeed, even the Portuguese Prime Minister Costa, his socialists, are thinking of joining. Um, and the Liberals as a group went up. As we know, the Greens also went up, which includes our own Greens, the German Greens, and the centre-left Socialist Democrats, centre-right EPP, went slightly down. The overall group of moderates, the overall bloc of the four of them, only went slightly down from 2014, I think from 526 seats to 506 or so, but I, I may be wrong on the precise figures. It was very slight. In other words, the extremists didn't gain much. But the Parliament will be fragmented, more fragmented than it was, precisely because the centre-left and centre-right lost to the Liberals and the Greens. So you can play with this in all sorts of ways. It's worth remembering, of course, that political groups at the European Parliament, and you know this better than me, Deputy Hai, you know, these are not full-blown political parties. These are alliances of national parties. They don't always vote together on, in the same way. Um, I'm not sure, for example, uh, politicians in Fine Gael always agree with the German Christian Democrats on tax, for instance. You know, and that's fine. And that's fine. Uh, I, I don't know if Fianna Fáil MEPs like Barry Andrews are going to always agree with President Macron's party. That's fine too. That's the way it should be. Because, you know, ultimately all these MEPs represent either independents or national parties. And that shouldn't be overlooked. I think, though, perhaps the bigger story is how the far left, the United Left, with Sinn Féin and independent TD, uh, MEP Luke Flanagan and maybe Claire Daly might join this group, actually lost some seats, including Podemos and Syria and Greece, and Greece is now about to have an election. That's interesting. They would describe themselves as Eurocritical, if I understand correctly, from Sinn Féin uh, MEP, MEP candidates. Um, the Eurosceptic centre-right group, the Conservatives and Reformists, which includes the Polish Governing Party, Law and Justice, and the UK Conservatives, also law seats. What's going on here? What's going on here? The problem is that the far-right nationalists gain seats, mainly because of Salvini, the Lega, in Italy. Le Pen stayed static on 23 seats with the national rally, but the Lega Nord went from 5 to 28, if I remember correctly. I think 28 was the final figure. So the far right has gained, and the Brexit party were in talks with the far right. Uh, of course, as you know, the parliament will be reduced overall, and we will gain uh, seats, as will other countries. In a nutshell, it will be more complicated, is the simplest answer. And I know that's not a useful answer. I would just suggest we need to see beyond the groups would be the simplest way I would answer the question. The good news is that the kind of the moderates, the centre has held in European politics. The last elections, you know, if we remember the Brexit referendum in 2016, and I remember very well it sounded like the Dutch were thinking about an exit and Le Pen might push for a Frexit. All of this already in 2017. The sceptics, though, have become less sceptical since Brexit. There's hardly anyone in the Netherlands calling for an exit. Even Le Pen doesn't call for a Frexit, and even Salvini doesn't call for an exit from the Euro. As much and all as he hates the bond markets, that tells you everything that you need to know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, again, uh, we want to thank you for being with us. We are honoured to have you here. Your uh, extent and, and breadth of knowledge 
and the subject is, is, is goes before you. We know that from dealing with you respectively over the years, and, and we thank you for being with us and giving us of your time. Uh, uh, we we now have to. Uh, we're going to go into private session to. Um, allow our guests to, to, to leave, and when we come back, uh, we will go back again into uh, private session.